George Johnson. Hey, John, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. And how are you? Oh, pretty good. I, I woke up yesterday with a chest cold, and it's a little worse today, but I think I can endure. I'm down on the floor, actually. <laughs> By on the floor. books. Yeah. You know, I, I mentioned before I was a judge for the Los Angeles Times Science Book Awards this year. Oh, yeah. And they're going to announce the winners in the last weekend in April during the book festival. But I just was impressed by how many, I mean, these are all the books that you can't see, but there's like a pile of 40, <clears throat> 47, I think, books. Holy these are cow. Most of the books that we considered, considered for the prize. I'm just going to. Run the camera over them a little closer. These are high high tech production, but um, I know to me it was just kind of a nice reminder that at least as of 1999, people were still you know writing and publishing science books. 1999. Oh God, 2009. <laughs> 2000. I think it's 2010, actually. No, oh, no, but, you, I, but these were all published in 2009, yeah. so okay. yeah, that, that part was a mistake. I'm sorry, I'm confused, no, too, a, now. Yeah, well, okay. I'm going to pull the finalists off of, off of the stack here. Yeah, I often do that where I skip a whole decade in a single sentence. And, <laughs> okay, and these are the... You're just giving more fodder for our enemies, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know there's that one guy that just hates it when we take so long to get into the show. Right. It's really so nice of him, though, to keep, keep, keep coming back and giving us another try. Yeah. Okay, so the finalists are uh, Cold by Bill Strever, Naming Nature by Carol Kysik Yoon, Marsha Bartusiak's The Day We Found the Universe, uh huh. Your Buddy Richard Rangham's Catching Fire, mm -hmm. and The Strangest Man. The Hidden Life of Paul Dirac, Mystic of the Atom, by uh, Graham Farmillo, British writer. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I just thought those were deserved, deserved to be celebrated. And at the end of April, we'll find out which one of those is, is the winning title. I mean, I, I already know, but I can't I'm sworn to secrecy, so... Well, that's good, George. I mean, Jesus, we, we spend enough time, and people in our profession spend enough time bemoaning the state of our profession, so um, I'm glad that you pointed that there are some people who are still plugging away out there, they're still publishing houses that are yeah. publishing the stuff we do, but presumably there are a few people who buy these damn books. I so, guess, uh, yeah, and there's some really good stuff in here, I mean, it was it was pretty hard to settle to settle on, um, on, on the finalists, because it's just some really nice writing and interesting ideas, and all of the ones that were finalists, you know, when you get down to the, a cut like that, there's so many arbitrary decisions as far as which, which is actually number one. Mm -hmm. well, so anyway, um, now I've reassembled my camera up on my desk here. So, well, good for you, and uh, you're uh, you're a real public citizen. I don't know what I would do if I was tapped to uh, to be a judge in one of those awards, just because I would be so uh, daunted at the thought of. Reading all those books. Yeah, that's when, a lot. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, sometimes you know, if you start a book and you get to f page fifty and it just hasn't hasn't grabbed you, you know, you can, you can kind of tell. And then, you know, the way it worked, there were three judges. So, like, if one of the other judges came back and said, "Oh God, I just love you know this book by so and so," and it was one that you'd go only gotten to page fifty and then abandoned, you know, then you'd say, "Oh well." Better go back and look at that. So, so there's yeah. a lot of back and forth like that before we finally, and then we finally found that uh, of the three judges, we made a list of of our five or six top contenders, and then there were several of them for, that got three votes and several that got two votes. So, you know that that gave us, um, you know, maybe a list of six or seven, and then it was just a matter of winnowing down from there. So, mm -hmm. it's an interesting experience. Yeah. Well. Um... I can't wait to see uh, who the winner is, and I hope it helps them sell lots of copies. <laughs> Me too. It's good for us all. Well, so I, um, uh, well, a couple of things. I just started uh, blogging for uh, Scientific American as a guest uh, Yeah, I noticed blogger. that. You had a couple of interesting things. Stirred up some hornet's nests. Yeah, um, so I thought I, I'm sort of curious to get your take on uh, the first 
piece that I published, which was, uh, okay, let's see, this, this is going to, our talk is going to air on Saturday, uh, March 27th. Uh, Scientific American posted this piece, I think it was uh, about um, nine days earlier on mm -hmm. its site. And uh, it was, um, I was describing a meeting that I went to, uh, actually right down the street from me. Mm -hmm. I'm living in Cold Spring now, Cold Spring, New York, right on the Hudson River. Yeah, this is the Garrison and, Institute, huh? Yeah, and the yeah. Garrison Institute is this uh, fabulous place. It's kind of a contemplative uh, retreat center, so they have a lot of uh, uh, Buddhists and people from other spiritual disciplines come there and uh, talk about meditation and so forth. But the owner um, or the founder of it, Jonathan Rose, who's this uh, real estate developer, part of the Rose family of uh, New York, uh, the same Roses who created the planetarium at the oh, American right. Mu Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. He's a very green guy. He's a real estate developer who has tried to come up with, I don't know if you'd call it sustainable uh, developments. And uh, so he has tried to... Uh, he has had a lot of um, conferences uh, and talks at the Garrison Center on mm -hmm. um, global warming and other environmental issues. Yeah. And uh, and they just had one um, last Friday, so this would be eight days from when people are listening to us here. And um, it was on it was a sort of brainstorming session by a lot of uh, pretty high ranking people in the environmental uh, community on how global warming could be uh, packaged more effectively to make the public take it seriously and accept that some pretty dramatic things had to be done to prevent some of the worst effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were even uh, hearing talks on uh, neuroscience and evolutionary psychology and cognitive science that um, examines how supposedly how uh, people react to different uh, stimuli with, uh, in some cases, with emotional parts of their brain, in other uh, cases mm -hmm. with uh, parts of the brain like the frontal cortex that supposedly underpin uh, reasoning and logic and so forth. Yeah. And the idea was that this kind of research could suggest ways basically to market environmentalism better. And uh, yeah. it reminded me a lot of, remember we've talked on this uh, on this show about uh, the old framing idea. Right, yeah. Of Chris Mooney. Exactly. And, I... Um, and I wasn't crazy about framing, actually. And, uh, yeah, I think we seems... both kind of, you know, just dismissed it as just kind of an obvious idea. I mean, whatever you're conveying, information no matter how accurately you're going to have to you know decide on an angle or a perspective and that's going to give it a you know a, a spin but not necessarily in a bad way but right. you know, not like in a political campaign at least you hope you're not going to do that with science although sometimes I'm sure it happens but um, yeah I mean the framing it's just what you do certainly as a writer that's right I mean we speaker. all frame I don't I don't want to pretend I'd be the last person to say that uh, there is some kind of, th that perfect objectivity is possible and, and just uh, kind of ladling out the uh, the facts, yeah. whatever those are, uh, can settle a uh, an issue. Yeah, but, uh, I'd, but I'd, I'd go further and say that there's no necessarily, there's not necessarily a conflict between objectivity and framing, that... You know, anytime right. you're going to convey information, there's these decisions you have to make. What am I going to start with first? What's foreground? What's background? Yeah. And, um, you know, in, I mean, I, in, in, I any, any number of different people would do it in different ways. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I know I'm not telling anything you don't know. So. Yeah, well, I, you know, I actually couldn't remember if we were in agreement on this or not. But uh, so anyway, I guess we were. And what bothered me about this meeting, and I, and I do understand that, I mean, I loved um, – an inconvenient truth. I thought it was a really powerful piece of propaganda in the best mm. sense. I mean, I you know I completely bought it. Um, yeah. But uh, even so, I think there were some things that Gore did that even people who basically agreed with him uh, thought yeah. that uh, thought might be overselling global warming. So, for example, yeah, which has uh, really backfired. Yes. 
And I think uh, that, um, you know, with Climate Gate, obviously there's been a lot of discussion of that. One of the disturbing things that um, I took away from that, uh, from these emails uh, of these uh, very prominent climatologists mm -hmm. that were disclosed, right. was that I thought they were too worried about framing and spinning uh, the data mm -hmm. and that um, it was um, hurting their credibility. And, and I was struck by there was an exchange between two people, one guy, I forget his name, at, uh, I think it was Jones at Anglia, East mm -hmm. Anglia, East Anglia, and Michael right. Mann, and they were talking about Andy Revkin, and they were sort of worried that, you know, he wasn't completely on board. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I remember. And I, of... I thought, Jesus Christ, you know, Andy Revkin is is uh, so important in letting people know about um, about uh, the you know the sort of details of global warming and getting people really concerned and informed about it and the fact that these guys were had sort of suspicions about him or saw saw him yeah. as a problem I thought showed that they had become too ideological yeah. Uh, yeah. in this whole debate and so at the Garrison Institute. What bothered me was that, uh, you know, the term I came up for what they were talking about there was neuroframing. So framing, uh, framing that was made even more pointed. Neuroframing. Yeah. 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 So uh, how is that different from regular framing? <laughs> yeah, well, it's basically saying that, that regular framing, just sort of regular rhetorical um, techniques need oh. to be... Uh, need to be informed uh, and enhanced by what we can learn from neuroscience and even evolutionary psychology oh, and cognitive God. science yeah. about how the brain works and how, uh, you know, how people react to uh, different pieces of information. Oh, I see. So you edit the film and say, well, we'll go for the reptilian brain in this sequence, and then we're going to, you know, try to move over and tingle the medulla oblongata with, uh, you know, this particular verse and... That's right. And, it's, you know, this stuff is pretty flaky. There's this whole field yeah. called neuroeconomics. Right, right. That, uh, you know, is basically trying to understand how people make um, financial economic decisions uh, with different parts of their brain. Yeah, and, well, that uh, seems this, like a legitimate inquiry, though, right? Yeah, but it's become very faddish. So now there are yeah. all these companies that supposedly allow you to do neuromarketing. They'll do oh, brain scans God. of consumers yeah. who are looking at toothpaste or yeah. you know, different kinds of wine and... And this will supposedly make the uh, the marketing more effective. Well, it all fits uh, in with this whole, you know, all the neurofiction on television now. Right. Yeah, like, were you watching that show before it, it finally crashed and burned called Dollhouse? No, I never even heard of it. Oh, God, it's just amazing. I mean, the, the, the premise is that, you you know, there was this corporation that basically gets these people to sign up and, you know, maybe it finds them in a bad life situation they want to get out of or you know, prisoner of the army or something. And they say, you know, if you'll if you'll volunteer, we're gonna do this you know, we're going to like basically wipe your brain clean and you'll still have all your old memories up till now and you'll get them back later. But we have this amazing technology and so we can reprogram you with this with these machines to play different roles and then people will pay for this. You know, like somebody might want a really hot date to um, an award ceremony or something. So he can go to the dollhouse and and um, say what he wants and you know pick the you know pick the body he likes and then the, they'll implant the memories so that this was a completely different person and then tweak it so that they're absolutely crazy about their escort or or, or, or there's more nefarious, even more nefarious things where, um, you know, they might need someone, you know, like a hitman. They might need some evil corporation might need a hitman. But, I mean, it just all, I mean, of course, everybody knows it's this absurd science fiction. But um, I'm sure a lot of people come away with this thinking that, um, you know, neuroscience is <laughs> way more advanced than it is and ever will be. Well, actually, I wanted to get back to that because I, I wrote another um, post for Scientific American that actually just came out on, um, on the use of uh, neuroscience to oh, make the... uh, weapons to yeah, help right. our, our soldiers and to disable the bad guys. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just want to – I actually wanted Long to ask con. you about some, something that <laughs> I had in this neuroframing post. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I mentioned – you know, one of the problems I have with uh, – Neuro with framing in general 
also is the assumption, and it came across very strongly at this this meeting I attend, attended. Um, and by the way, some of the people at the meeting were there were people from Yale and uh, Harvard. There was a strong presence of the uh, National Resources uh, Defense Council. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the premise was that any uh, informed, rational, intelligent person will accept that global warming is uh, real, that it's bad, and that we need to do something about it. Yeah, and I put, yeah that's not true. Well, yeah, I'm, I, and I actually am a global warming believer, but I know from interviewing my students that some very smart kids don't believe in, in uh, global warming. Yeah. And also, um, I... Uh, know that there are some people at the uh, at the science section of the New York Times. Well, yeah, you said that in your article. And yeah, yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, actually, I thought. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and say what you said. And, well, so I so, said that uh, you know I, I I had to I actually was cautious in how I I worded it. I didn't want to overstate it, but I I think what I actually said was that um, a majority of uh, a majority of the editorial staff of the Science Times doubts that human-induced global warming represents a serious threat to humanity. Yeah, that's and, certainly. Yeah, when I when I read that, my reaction was, "How could you possibly know that?" And it didn't it didn't ring true to me. Well, I first heard it from um, a reporter there uh, several years ago. Yeah. And then uh, I can I, I I ran it by uh, another person. Who confirmed that that was his impression as yeah. well? I don't know. I mean, to me, I mean, Laura Chang, I thought, had a very good reply to you in the comments section. You know, she's the science editor of the New York Times. And, right. And she was saying, I can't remember how many people were on the editorial staff there. 20, many, she said. How many? Yeah. 20. 20. Yeah. And how could you possibly, I mean, did you actually poll them all? And, and, um, I mean, to me, yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure they all, if they're good editors, are going to be skeptical of global warming, and they're going to be skeptical of the skeptics. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just how a good editor thinks. You know, you want to make sure your reporters don't get carried away on the bandwagon, and sometimes you're going to act as devil's advocate. To, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, mean that you're a, an official, you know, climate change skeptic. Yeah, um, well, the the way it was described to me, it was a little stronger than that. Not kind of, um, not kind of open mindedness in principle that any good journalist should have, but uh, but actually uh, just uh, the same kind of doubts that are expressed by by um, a lot of uh, non journalists yeah. and a lot of uh, non scientists and even by uh, some students that I have. Here yeah, but students. were they suggesting that that's skewing the the Times coverage in a skeptical, no, skeptical I, way? Actually, no, I, I, I mean, I don't I see how anyone you, would make that case. I think if you look at the Times coverage, uh, you can see that it, w you know, I would call it uh, balanced in the best sense, not uh, yeah. phony balance, but, um, but uh, a balance that reflects legitimate uh, questions about, mm -hmm. first, the evidence for uh, significant human-induced global warming, and second... Yeah. Uh, the case for um, dramatic interventions mm -hmm. to reduce fossil fuel emissions, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, actually, uh, Andy Revkin, uh, who just um, quit as a reporter there, has got a uh, you know there was a, there was a uh, the public editor at the uh, the Times right. had a column. I think his name is Oakrent. Oh, that's uh, a, that's a previous previous incarnation. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so the new guy had a column after ClimateGate about how the Times. Some people were claiming that the Times hadn't addressed it quickly enough and right. didn't take it seriously yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, I read that. And they had some comments from. Um, they had a comment from Andy, for example, saying that uh, he. I think the the phrase that he used with the, was that the Times had never really bought into the uh, catastrophist uh, version of uh, global warming, yeah. which actually upset some of the really hardcore global warming uh, believers like hmm. uh, Joe Rahm over at uh, Climate Progress. Yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, it did cause kind of a, a shitstorm, actually. But uh, that, that, <laughs> and, that, and this is all this is all related uh, to this neuroframing and framing. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to tie that in. If I well, yeah, I just, just to brought up the, the theme, times theme going right. here, so they can. Yeah, I just brought up the times as an example of uh, people that uh, I didn't think could be. Um, I, I think there were there are people who are obviously very well informed mm-hmm. uh, and uh, smart, and yet um, they're just simply not completely buying the uh, the most the kind of Al Gore version of uh, global warming. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think and that's so I don't good. Think, and I don't think more framing will fix that problem. No, no, and I'm not sure it's a problem. I mean, when, when you're talking about, you know, the climate, you know, no matter how the strong, how strong the evidence is, when you have all these complex models and all of these different techniques for um, for um, dealing with the data, you know, and and then taking um, modern day data and then trying to make it consistent, you know, consistent as far as the standards for how it's produced with data that was you know, just sort of inferred historically. I mean, there's always going to be room for doubt. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, so... Actually, I think, well, yeah, you and I disagree. I think uh, on some of these um, issues, the you, you can... Um, you can uh, prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know. Maybe we haven't. I guess we haven't reached that point with. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's. I, we have certainly haven't reached the point where I'd say it's on the same. What would the word be? Ontological level as um, as uh, evolution, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, you can also argue that. Well, you know, it's possible that. Uh, you know, the black swan will you know come along out of all the white swans and will completely. You know, change our whole view of human evolution or or heliocentrism or anything. But yeah, no, I take your point that stuff like that, I mean, seems so well established at some point. You argue that you shouldn't even call it a theory; it really is a fact. And, right. And I've argued before that no, nah, it's always always a theory, and that's what's kind of cool about it. <laughs> well, so I I was hoping we could also talk about this. Um, uh, something that I just uh, yeah the neural posted. war stuff yeah, AugCog um, augmented cognition and yeah I read your article I mean in your blog post and and then it really so why, why don't you summarize what you said in your in your post and well so this was something that was um, inspired by a um, a person who I brought to Stevens to give a talk a few weeks ago a guy named Jonathan Marino mm, who's an right. ethicist at the University of Pennsylvania. And he wrote a book about uh, a topic that I've been interested in in quite a while, which is uh, the use of uh, neuroscience and related uh, fields, sort of brain and cognitive science, to uh, by the Pentagon, mm-hmm. right. uh, to uh, for two purposes, uh, both to enhance the capabilities of our soldiers and to mess up. Uh, the bad guys. And yeah. this ranges from um, you know fairly uh, conventional stuff like uh, drugs, uh, amphetamine stimulants that fighter pilots can take to stay up for much yeah. longer periods, uh, knockout drugs yeah. that uh, can disable the the, uh, the enemy, um, hallucinogens uh, that are used as yeah. uh, incapacitants. <laughs> but the really far out stuff is. Uh, Electrodes that can be implanted in the brains of our soldiers to enhance uh, yeah. uh, perceptions and even uh, yeah. memory and other um, cognitive mm. uh, functions. So it, yeah. you know, a lot of it is very sort of far out sci-fi stuff. There's a whole history of using at least psychology, but also uh, psychopharmacology, um, the uh, studies of LSD and so forth. It goes right, back at least right. to the 50s. There was a lot of top secret stuff done back then. And it's all coming back in a pretty big way now. Yeah. And uh, Marino wrote a book about this called Mind Wars. It came mm-hmm. out in 2006, and he's been kind of tracking it since then, as I have. And um, what I think <clears throat> makes this particularly uh, important to pay attention to now is that neuroscientists were sort of embarrassed and a little bit secretive about uh, taking all this money from the Pentagon uh, just a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, you know, I did an article on this for Discover about, I don't know, five or six years ago. Mm. But now it seems to be right out in the open. And there, yeah. was, a big, um, there was a big report published by the National Academy of Sciences uh, last fall basically telling 
neuroscientists how they could jump on the uh, the Defense Department uh, gravy train. Yeah, but and, how, uh, how how recent is that though? I mean, I thought I mean certainly artificial intelligence research and neural networks and things like that. Those were getting getting uh, significant funding from like DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and ONR, the Office of Naval Research. You know, way back in the Mid to mid to late '80s, when I was writing about that stuff. That's true. Artificial intelligence uh, has a really long associated w- association with uh, well, computer science, which was practically Pentagon. invented yeah. by <laughs> invented as a military spinoff and has led yeah. to all kinds of great things. Hey, the uh, the the internet uh, really the internet. began as a yeah. uh, as a DARPA DARPA uh, net. yeah ARPA net. DARPA yeah. project uh, yeah. to link. Uh, researchers and uh, DARPA is one of the major funders of um, neuroscience on uh, how the brain codes information and mm-hmm. and on uh, interfaces between the brain and yeah. machines. So it's really, I guess, the what's well, new and it's not completely new, uh, mm-hmm. but it's just coming out into the open more is the emphasis on brain science specifically not just uh yeah. you know, artificial intelligence well yeah now you can go to like a science. neuroscience society meeting i'm sure and you can see all this research that probably scientists have been doing for years and now they've managed to give it a little spin in order to get some darpa money and right and framing <laughs> they're taking it and framing it as something that'll possibly have military applications when maybe deep down they don't believe that at all well i think so well, some of them have some of them have privately told me, you know, they're in different modes. In one yeah. mode, if they sense that you as a journalist are really interested in writing a kind of uh, enthusiastic sci-fi piece, they'll talk about all the Matrix, uh, yeah. $6 million man kind of stuff that can be done. But if they sense that you are writing a skeptical uh, piece, then they'll say, or that you think that there are ethical problems, mm-hmm. they'll say, oh, well, you know, Jesus, a memory prosthesis, that's never going to happen. Yeah, you take yeah. that seriously, and this is just a way to get funding for uh, basic research on how the brain works and so forth. Yeah, um, I mean, that's, that was my impression, but um, I don't know, way, you know, in your, in your blog post, you, you link to this, this big, thick um, uh, report on all this. What was it called? It's called Opportunities in Neuroscience yeah. for Future Army Applications. Okay, that's on the web, and I, you know, I can't say that I read all 160 pages or whatever it is, but I went to the conclusion where they were making all these recommendations, and, and maybe they're hiding all the really cool stuff and keeping it out of the report, but it sounded to me, you know, just to give another perspective, it sounded pretty innocuous. You know, it was things like, Using what we're learning in um, neuroscience to have you know more effective training methods or ways to treat post-traumatic shock syndrome. I mean post-traumatic stress syndrome and shock, and improving you know the ability to sleep or to get along with um, irregular sleep or you know, enhanced decision making. And you know and then with the technology, better brain machine interfaces. So you have these helmets where you have these little sensors that are maybe monitoring the twitching of your eye muscles and things to see where your attention is being focused and if you're being distracted and then use these algorithms to decide you know where to try to draw your attention on the monitor or uh, right. how how quick uh, what what pace they can give you information now without give, having you suffer from information overload and defeating the whole purpose so kind of pacing it so that it you know matches the natural rhythms of the brain so that that stuff all sounded pretty you know, yeah, I guess. Um, well, first of all, I think. House kind of stuff. Yeah, I think they. I, I think that these guys are putting the best face on it, uh, and kind of presenting it in um, bland uh, kind of uh, uh, techno mm. Pentagon uh, jargon, so that it doesn't sound uh, scary. But I've talked to some of the people who um, are doing this research. I've talked to people at DARPA. I talked to a, a guy who is the head of the. Um, uh, man machine interface program at DARPA when I did this discover article back in I guess it was like 2000 and and uh, four and yeah. he said that they were definitely interested in bionic soldiers who could instantly download large intelligence uh, programs mm-hmm. uh, there were there have been Pentagon officials who've talked about the possibility of remote uh, 
command and control of soldiers with uh, implants in their brains. Um, yeah, that Marino, stuff definitely wasn't in the report. <laughs> yeah, Marino, Marino has talked about... Yeah, I should uh, read that book because Marino I... Marino has talked about the possibility. Here, this is really creepy, and it's... it's and, and here's a, just an example of something that can sound really innocuous, but then you realize um, that uh, its implications are kind of uh, scary. So something just like taking... Um, beta blockers, for example, yeah. before battle. So yeah. there's some suggestion that beta blockers will prevent uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Yeah, we have, yeah, musicians use them all the time before performance. Yeah, well, in this case, if you've got a guy going into battle, you take beta blockers, and it means that you can witness or be involved in yeah. something really horrible, an atrocity, mm -hmm. and you won't suffer from... Uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or even mm. um, uh, extreme guilt. So what Marino yeah. says is that this raises the possibility of, of soldiers who, um, who are, uh, you can also use drugs to eliminate fear, yeah. uh, who uh, become you know, less than human. They're actually not traumatized yeah. in situations where they should be traumatized. Yeah. Well, I guess there's two ways to look at it. I mean... Someone has to go to war, and I can just hardly imagine how horrible it must be to be in that position and to have to go out and fight, and horrible things are going to happen. And um, if there's some way you can alleviate uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome in such a way that someone who's doing what soldiers have done you know, since time immemorial uh, so that they're not completely debilitated psychologically after that, and you know maybe to the point where they would um, put themselves and their their company in harm's way. Here's so here's called. the problem I, mean, I have just, with that. Yeah, I think I think that the plausibility of those sorts of technologies is low. Oh, I think they're and it's, I think I think that the possibility <laughs> I think that the possibility of this adversely affecting the image of America even more than it already is, is high. Yeah, the idea yeah. that we should be taking neuroscience, which is this amazing, uh, great adventure in trying to understand how our own brains work and how our minds work and possibly solve the, uh, the mind-body problem and maybe come up with more effective uh, or, or truly effective treatments for mental illness is being diverted into weapons, into making the United States an yeah. even more dominant superpower that yeah. can kick the well, shit out yeah. of everybody in the world. It's terrible. It's yeah. terrible. Yeah. We are. Yeah. I don't know. I. I mean, I, it, it's. I, it's kind of funny. You know, I'm sounding like this this militarist hawk or something, and I'm you know pretty close to being a pacifist and probably generally share your your whole view on war, except for being very optimistic that it'll ever end. But um, I don't know, and I mean, so much of this stuff, like uh, information workload management, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, this, this seems like perfectly legitimate form of inquiry for the military to be involved in. And then there's yeah. this question, too, of, you know, if all, you know, all this money, like, that went originally into computer science from DARPA and these other, other defense department agencies, ended up funding very, very basic research that, uh, you know, spawned whole fields and, you know, it's probably led to us being able to sit here and talk to each other with our computers and, you know, waste an hour and <laughs> have right. the Internet and loggingheads.tv and all this neural network research and understanding, you know, possible deep theories of how uh, networks, whether they're artificial or neural, process information. So... You know, devil's advocate, you could say that there's, you know, some good stuff that's going to come out of this. And well, you know, Marino, um, even though he's drawing attention to it and thinks that there are some really serious ethical uh, issues that need to be discussed, yeah, he opposes, sure um, I mean, there's actually, a, I think, a guy at the University of Oregon who has a, uh, uh, is trying to get uh, neuroscientists to sign a pledge that they will never take any funding from any uh, national security um, organization, uh, yeah. Defense Department, CIA, NSA, anything like that. Yeah, a few like computer that. scientists did that, like uh, Douglas Hofstadter. Oh, really? Er early on, refused, it refused to take any Defense Department money for his AI research. 
Well, Marino, for some of the same reasons that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. he says he thinks that's wrong. He says that huh. he thinks that neuroscientists should remain engaged, and then the uh, you'll have good people doing the research. They can apply their ethics yeah. uh, to to the research that's actually been done. They can help keep uh, the field uh, transparent. He says it's possible that. This will produce weapons that are more humane. It will produce uh, non-lethal weapons. Hmm. You know, so there's a lot of uh, yeah. interest in um, in mind reading devices, lie detection, and yeah. even uh, more sci-fi stuff uh, using MRI to actually read the thoughts of a terrorist yeah. subject, for example, to find out what he's. Uh, plotting and Marino says that uh, you know this would be more humane than yeah. waterboarding them or yeah. you know, pulling their yeah. fingernails out or yeah. or whatever. So those are. But I just think that I just think that on balance, this is the last thing that the United States needs to be diverting this wonderful research project, trying to understand well, the brain. Yeah, but are, is to, it diverting it though? I mean, I'm, we're just kind of going around and around, but. Um, I mean, I hate the fact that we live in a world where most of the money available for very basic research, you know, like this, in most basic research, um, comes from the Defense Department or, you know, maybe from pharmaceutical companies. And, you know, we don't have this enlightened society that just says, hey, we all should, um, you know, pay a certain amount of taxes and a portion of this taxes should go to fund, you know, basic research in all different fields of science and Mm -hmm. You know, it just isn't that way. And then, so the question is, is whether this is really diverting all these wonderful things that will, will uh, that would have happened otherwise in neuroscience by steering it toward the military, or will it just actually, you know, bring those things along, you know, more quickly, even if it's not for reasons that, uh, you know, are so admirable. Well, if we had, if we could uh, do something about the one trillion dollars that we're diverting to uh, defense purposes and come up with a more uh, sane way of dealing with problems around the world, then, uh, you know, maybe we yeah, have more money yeah. for uh, civilian yeah, yeah. Uh, neuroscience. Yeah, yeah. I know that sounds ridiculous. No, I mean, even. no, it's good. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be optimistic. <laughs> it's good to be idealistic. If I keep trying to hold all. on to that. It's, <laughs> it gets harder every year. But, yeah, I'm on the fence about this, and you know a lot more about it than I do, so. It's scary stuff, George. I, you yeah, should get a copy it, of uh, I will. I'll get that book, and um, then I'll go back and read your article and discover. But um, also, you know, isn't there a difference, though, between the government funding research that takes place at universities, and all of this stuff is accounted for and um, in there in the public records, if anyone cares to look, and having like secret government labs, you know, underground somewhere where, you know, evil, evil scientists, you know, that are like holdovers from the Nazis or something or, or doing, you know, this uh, dollhouse type neuroscience research. I mean, that's not happening, right? Well, of course, it's secret, so we wouldn't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think um, uh, Marino would probably have a sense if there was research uh, like that, but he, he says there's mm. there's. There is some stuff that is kind of, it's unclassified, but it's hard to figure out what is going on. So he gave an example when he gave his talk of uh, somebody actually knows, I think at, at uh, Penn State, who was doing on some, uh, had a grant proposal that Marino noticed. He sort of scours uh, these grant proposals, mm -hmm. which are made publicly available, and saw something on, um, on uh, I think, mortar shell incapac incapacitant distribution systems and it turned out to be um, a way of uh, you, you have mortar shells filled with fentanyl which yeah. is a, uh, a an anesthetic it's a knockout drug it was the oh same yeah drug. It's, a, it's, it's the animal tranquilizer right well it's the drug that the russians used That's in that enemy. incident where it when chechenin uh, insurgents oh. captured the big theater in Moscow and held everybody in there, and then the Russians injected this fentanyl gas into it, and oh, it killed, oh. I think, I don't know, 130 people, especially all the children yeah, inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th yeah. So right. we're working yeah. on that now, uh, yeah. also. But it, but you'd never, you know, it's these things are put in language that makes them 
you, you have to actually decode it to figure well, out. Well, yeah, what's that going would that, that would explain kind of the you know, the rather bland tone of this this Pentagon report that I was referring to. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> now, the other thing I took a shot at, I'm just firing wildly in all directions. Yeah, that's computer. good. We've got to kind of have a neuro theme going here. So. Yeah. Yeah, there were this a couple was, of really good articles. Um, you know, it's been like more than a month, I think, since we talked, so I've been kind of putting things aside that, that, that struck me, and there are a couple of um, good good pieces on antidepressants, but um, we can go there later if we have time. Well, We've already I just, talked about that. Well, I just wanted to get, so there's one other thing I mentioned, the same piece that mm-hmm. I, uh, in, in which I talked um, about neuroweapons, I had uh, a little section talking about these um, brain exercise uh, gadgets and programs that are now being uh, uh, marketed by, in one case, one of the great living neuroscientists, a guy named uh, uh, Mike um, Merzenich. Hmm. Uh, He's the person who really, I'm not sure if you can say he he discovered neuroplasticity how the how the brain is constantly rewiring itself and is extremely uh, responsive to experience but he um, he is uh, somebody who really helped to show just how dramatic uh, mm-hmm. plasticity in the brain can yeah. be and now he's got this company called posit science which sells these programs that are pretty expensive uh, mm. typically about $400 each, that supposedly can improve your memory and perceptions, yeah. help you think faster, uh, focus better, yeah. remember more. That's from... Well, yeah, what, what are, they, are they like verbal exercises you do? Or? Well, they're, you know, they've got some that are uh, focused on, um, on different parts of cognition, so for either mm-hmm. uh, vision in some cases, hearing, or uh, memory. But what's weird about them, and I actually first found out about them Last fall, I just started getting these emails that, and I was just deleting them at first mm-hmm. uh, because they just seemed like spam. You know, mm-hmm. they were obviously mm-hmm. advertising some kind of cheesy gadget, and <laughs> I wasn't interested. And then I don't know something about them uh, intrigued me, and I opened one up, and I found out that it was a, a, a company founded by this guy, uh, Merzenich. At, that supposedly exploiting his work on neuroplasticity, come up mm. with these devices that basically are supposed to help baby boomers wa- ward off the uh, natural losses of memory and so forth that you get yeah. with um, age. And there's this huh. huge industry now. It's called the uh, neurobics. Neurobics. Oh God. Uh, there should just you know, be like, like a. There should be a. A federal ban on the use of the word neuro as a prefix for yeah it's really anything. reaching that point yeah, it's just um, getting... and I just I don't know and there you know already this this industry has expanded so fast that uh, there are some scientists who are warning about uh, hype and overselling I quote a um, a group uh, that published a statement with the Stanford Center on longevity uh, saying that. Uh, you know, some of these programs, you'll get really good at doing the task uh, that the program uh, gives you, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily translate into generalized cognitive improvement. Mm, so, mm. so there's very little uh, good empirical data on whether these products are actually uh, yeah. good for you. And it, it just seems but they're just like example. they're just like mind exercises. Is that what they yeah. are? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. it just seemed huh. another example to me of kind of neuroscientists going after a buck. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we all need, we're, we're all going after bucks, but yeah. it's just, yeah. they, I, I expect them, well, here's the last line of my piece. I said, neuroscientists are attempting to solve the most profound secrets of human existence. They should adhere to higher ethical standards than defense contractors and infomercial pitchmen. <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> here, here. Yeah, I agree with that. So um, what kind of reaction did you get from neuroscientists? Well, it was just posted about two hours ago. Oh, that's so, right. Yeah, that's right. You sent me a copy that I read read beforehand. By the so, time our talk is posted on Saturday, though, it will have been out for uh, three days. Yeah, well, so I'll be I'm, interested to see what, what people say. Yeah, me too. You know, while you were talking, I was holding up something I got in the mail 
called Natural Brain Speed. And this was just sent to me out of the blue. It's like a pamphlet with a little little bag of this stuff. And it says, helps improve decision making, helps increase work productivity, think faster, dietary supplement. Right. Two tablets. You know, the first ones are always free. <laughs> yeah. Is it, yeah. Does it have ginkgo in it? Probably. I actually got this several years ago, and while we were talking, I remembered that it was in my desk drawer because I thought sometime I might, you know, write something, something about about it. Well, the um, yeah, it the doesn't Stanford's, say what's in it, which is even. Well, that's a big part of this whole uh, this whole uh, brain health industry is yeah. the uh, the drugs, and yeah. those are those are associated with even more egregiously unproven claims than the um, than the uh, oh, yeah, I mean, based exercise programs. Yeah, no, I mean, this is just complete nonsense. It has something called rhodiola extract root. No, that stuff actually works. Oh, really? <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. I have no idea. And some idea. other things that I, I – it's the – Print's awfully small, so I can't read it too well. Toothed club moss extract. What? Boy. What? Toothed club moss, I think it says. Toothed club yeah, moss? Yeah, toothed. Yeah, like uh, club moss. <laughs> wow. Jeez. I have to try some of that, you know, next time you're working on deadline. And, oh, then there's thiamine, and niacin, and pantothenic acid. And, yeah. Know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> hey, caffeine works for me. Yeah, caffeine. Hmm. That's my neuro enhancer. Yeah. yeah. In fact, here I am on sucking down some iced tea as we speak. Ah. ah. So, uh, all right. Well, did you want to talk about those? Uh, oh, yeah. Let me see. I have them on another screen here. Um, yeah, those were especially, I, I really... Louis Menand, I don't, I'm not sure if I... Yeah, Louis Menand, his. yeah, yeah, that was, it was like a, in the New Yorker. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for it here, and it was like a, uh, it was like a, a review of a couple of new, new books about antidepressants, but then he, you know, turned it into this great essay, just basically discussing the literature and, and all of this stuff, you know, going way back to the days before Valium, like Milltown. You know, that was a real blast from the past. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Mama's Little Helper and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah, um, it, it, uh, yeah, I read some, about some of those old uh, drugs, and I wonder what happened to them, you know? I, yeah. Did, did they, um, you know, maybe what happened to them is that they, uh, their patent ran out, and so there's not a, uh, the, the... Well, the yeah, then you change a few, you have to move a few atoms, over right. and then yes, you, know, so you can turn it into a new, a new thing to patent. But you know, some things like Valium, you know, which was, uh, I can't remember what year that came out, but uh, you know that 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 certainly still exists, and and all these refinements too that are supposed to have less, uh, you know, it was called uh, diazepam, and there's right. all these kind of variants that have come out of that that are supposed to have um, have uh, fewer fewer side effects. And, Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's all considered to be the same mechanism that, uh, I don't know how sure are they with, I, I know with the SSRI antidepressants, it's really, you know, it's just hypothesized that this is working by regulating serotonin and it's not really at all established. Mm -hmm. In fact, in this article, Lewis Menand referred to that as like the, the, the man in the waiting room theory of how the, how the antidepressants work. And he asserted that no one really seriously believes that, which... You know, if that's true, that's a pretty, pretty strong statement. Yeah, um, I was surprised that he said that because I know that every time there is one of these uh, big uh, s studies um, suggesting that uh, SSRIs don't really work that well, mm -hmm. and uh, there, was, there was one that came out fairly recently that we actually talked about back in uh, January, I think. You've got all the defenders who come out. Uh, and talk about how well the SSRIs uh, work, and they sort of reiterate that. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, the serotonin yeah, the, the whole problem of subjective experience versus. I mean, yeah. The last time we were talking about that big study, the meta-analysis that that concluded very controversially that uh, you know, except for very severe depression, SSRIs are no better than placebos. Mm -hmm. And then one thing that Manan brings up that is really intriguing in this article as well. Yeah, but even if that's 
true, you know, <laughs> if the placebo effect is working. Right. Yeah, because this is, I mean, it's not, it, it's interesting. Like, he, he referred to some cardiac, cardiovascular drugs that apparently are used because they work, and it's believed, at least by some scientists, to be a placebo effect. Mm-hmm. And I was yeah. thinking about that. Like, I have to take blood pressure drugs, and, you know, they describe this mechanism about how it's blocking, you know, something called angiotensin receptor inhibitors. And it makes me want to go back and do some research on what I'm taking and to see if that's established. And maybe it is, but is that established any better than uh, serotonin regulation for SSRIs? And, and you know, right. when you look at the little package inserts for any of these drugs, it's always kind of amazing how little difference there is between the placebo <laughs> Control group and the and the uh, the group that gets the drugs is just often these seemingly minor little differences. Right. So and you the know there could be all kinds of drugs that are working because of placebo effects. Yeah, it is a little scary. Um, by the way, are the, the the drug that you're taking for uh, for uh, blood pressure is it a beta blocker? No, no. I I actually tried tried those because you know I I had to we had to come up with like a triple triple cocktail before something finally finally worked and and the third one we tried a beta blocker and that didn't do anything and um and you know and so i took them and i i didn't feel any side effects actually what i you know i actually made a point of taking them a few times like when i had to go to a a meeting to give a talk to see if it really helped helped fight stage fright and i couldn't yeah really, i couldn't tell any difference but of course i'm sure it depends on the dosage yeah um, and you don't you don't get that you don't get great stage fright either do you oh yeah i mean you know the only way i can overcome it is i just have to kind of plunge in and, and start talking and then oh okay oh yeah i hate that moment when you like if you're giving a talk do you get that too i you know it's funny i, I don't i've had it on and off for yeah. years usually i but I, I i talk so much i think actually being on blogging heads uh, helps. I talked so yeah, much. Uh, in yeah, public that's now helped that me too. So I, glad we're getting yeah, something good out of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, hey, did you see? Yeah, I thought the the Menon piece was just a wonderful, you know, yeah. sort of snide, but appropriately so. Very over, yeah, yeah, subtle and you know, just a very just just kind of a wonderful kind of encapsulation of the whole controversy and philosophy behind all this yeah and and just how you've got all these uh you know psychiatry and psychology and all the uh the, the disciplines that try to understand and treat mental illness have um you know they they have so many different critics but all the critics contradict each other yeah and so yeah. It's, it's really a classic example of a field that's in a i don't know pre-paradigm stage uh yeah, uh, as uh, Thomas Kuhn would put it, <laughs> right. it, it just hasn't gotten its great unifying uh, uh, theory, and so yeah. you know, you've just got you've got every every single different um, major uh, figure in the field yeah. has his or her own uh, different theory. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, and, and, and uh, one of his really interesting themes too that kind of leads to the the other article, which was in the New York Times Magazine, is this idea <laughs> of. Uh, confusing sadness with depression or confusing a, a rational reaction of being depressed about, you know, a depressing world or at least a depressing corner of the world and something that should be medically treated and, and included in the, um, you know, the standard standard um, directory of mental illnesses. Right. Yes, and that was really the, you know, the it started out, you know, it was this piece in the New York Times Sunday Magazine right. by... Um, Oh, Jonah Lehrer. Yeah, Jonah Lehrer, who's there, who's really, really very good, and kind of this rising young star of neuro, neuro writing. Mm -hmm. And this really started out with um, presenting this. I guess there was recently a big paper on this, but just presenting the idea that's been presented before, but apparently more strongly recently that um, there's something the analytic rumination hypothesis that being depressed can actually be there's actually maybe an evolutionary usefulness for it because it forces your brain into this uh, very deliberate, analytical, ruminative state where you go over and over and think through your problems and that this can you know, help you solve and overcome them and, and go on to survive and produce children. But 
and he starts out with Charles Darwin as an example of having what may have been depression, but it sounds like it had all kinds of <laughs> kinds of things going on there. And how um, you know, I guess the implication is if he had been treated with SSRIs or some other drug, if uh, he wouldn't have come up with the um, origin of species. Or maybe he would have published sooner. <laughs> maybe that's, that's kind of what I would argue. I mean, I started reading this article, and at first, I just really found it extremely annoying. And yeah. I just thought, you know, we talked about this before, and, you know, we both have um, had episodes of what we considered to be, um, you know, depression. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing positive about it. No. You know, you're, you, you know it's not that you're... You're going into this mode where you're very ruminative and thinking and being able to sit back and objectively say, well, you know, maybe I should have done this, and now I can learn about this in the future. You know, you just get stuck in these horrible, tight little loops where your mind just obsesses over the same same um, little thing, like, gee, maybe if I hadn't said that, you know, my girlfriend wouldn't have broken up with me, and, yeah, or if I'd given her, you know, um, uh, a dozen roses for a birthday instead of half a dozen. I mean, you just get fixated mm -hmm. on these, you know, ridiculous little loops that you can't break out of, which is what makes me think, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, a lot of people think this, that depression is just an extra, inextricably intertwined with obsessive-compulsive kind yeah. of behavior. And so I'm reading this kind of cheery stuff in this, this New York Times Sunday Magazine article, and it's just, I was just finding it outrageous. But then... I realized that the way the article was written, he started out like this, and by the time you, you know, got deeper into it, he very strongly presented the other side of the argument, and mm -hmm. very effectively by quoting a short story by David Foster Wallace, who, yes. of course, committed suicide last year, called The Depressed Person. And in Lear's article, he says, it's, the story's filled with sentences like this, a solipsistic, self-consumed, bottomless, emotional vacuum and sponge. That yeah. perfectly describes depression. And then this line's from from John Lear, which is which is a really, really nice uh, nice two sentences. It says, in this view, there is nothing profound about depressive rumination. There is just a recursive loop of woe. A yeah, recursive no, loop of woe. The problem I the problem I had with this article, I thought it was very well written it had lots of wonderful examples both from modern science and from history and even cites uh, aristotle on the uh, the linkage of uh, wisdom wisdom to uh, uh, melancholy and you've got of course the old theme uh, linking um, creativity to uh, madness um, and it, it's very artfully done but it poses mm -hmm. this kind of um, fairly dramatic uh, thesis in the beginning that maybe we have over-medicalized depression and that it has some kind of adaptive function. He brings in evolutionary psychology and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then <clears throat> sort of comes all the way around and adds all the caveats. And by the end, it's sort of saying what? That, yeah, you know, depression yeah, actually yeah. is a really devastating disease, except when it isn't. You yeah, know, except I know. when it's well, appropriate. Yeah. That's, that's just what, so true so often in the magazine form, you know? Yeah, and I, yeah. I also, I, I dislike, or I'm just so suspicious of the uh, evolutionary psychology uh, contribution to yeah. um, to these sorts of takes on mental illness. Well, yeah, and it kind of gives the, the mess message, too, that everything you know, that we do or everything about any living creature has to have an evolutionary purpose when, of course, yeah. a lot of stuff just goes along for the ride or it's not so harmful that it keeps you from reproducing. Yeah, I, you know, there was, um, I was doing some background research on this and uh, on evolutionary psychology and mental illness, and I came up with a couple of interesting little Many theories from uh, Robert Sapolsky, the mm -hmm. uh, the wonderful biologist at Stanford, and he mm -hmm. talks about um, the uh, you know you've got the the classic example of a disease like uh, sickle cell malaria that um, when you just have uh, one of the genes instead of both genes it confers resistance to malaria, mm -hmm. and there are actually other examples of this that I hadn't heard of so. Uh, cystic fibrosis, if you only carry one of the um, uh, genes, you are resistant to cholera. Yeah. And uh, with Tay-Sachs disease, which is absolutely devastating, yeah. 
um, again, if you carry only one of the genes, you're resistant to uh, tuberculosis. Yeah. So then, um, so then Sapolsky said, could there be any uh, analog of this with uh, diseases like schizophrenia? And then, he, and he talks oh. about how you've got people who sort of are, uh, they, I think the term is uh, schizotypal. So they don't have full-blown schizophrenia, but they probably have um, maybe some of the genes that uh, contribute to schizophrenia, and uh, and they tend to be kind of uh, superstitious and self-absorbed, mm -hmm. and some of them mm -hmm. have very vivid dreams. They may even have sort of partial hallucinations, and he says that through um, history and human evolution, maybe some of these people would become... I mean, you can guess it, shamans, right? The medicine men, right, uh, right, visionaries right. in the tribe yeah. who uh, serve some kind of religious yeah. uh, function. It's it's just, you know, it's very clever. Sapolsky is really good at this kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. But it, it's just, well, yeah, mean, it really it's, is a classic just-so story. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's, there's always a thin line, you know, between yeah. a very, very clever evolutionary hypothesis and then, and sometimes you just got to kind of step back and remind yourself that some stuff just happens. And, right. You know, if, if it's, it doesn't have to be beneficial as long as it's not non-detrimental. Right. I mean, it's only non-detrimental things... to living long enough to reproduce. Right. So. You know, we're extraordinarily complex organisms. Yeah. It's not so, you know, the surprise is that things don't go wrong with us even more often than they do. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just hanging on by the skin yeah. of our teeth, George. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. Hey, you know something? What? We filled an hour. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it again. Wasted a perfectly good hour watching <laughs> bloggingheads.tv. So, um, well, maybe we should wrap up then. Yeah. Well, that was, uh, boy, we, I, you know, we actually had a uh, consistent three theme it's great. Yeah. To end, yeah considering how little little planning went into that, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. Well, maybe next time we talk, uh, well, sometime in the future, you can tell us what book won the uh, LA. Yeah, as long uh, as it's prize. after, yeah, the LA Times uh, Book Award, Book Prize. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the, the Los Angeles Times Book Festival is the last weekend in April. I'm actually mm -hmm. going to be out there because I'm uh, going to be. Uh, heading up a panel on science writing, and the members are going to be Casey Cole, you mm -hmm. know, from Los Angeles, formerly of the Los Angeles Times, um, Jennifer Ouellette, ah. who's been on here here before, and Marcia Bartusiak. Wow. Yeah, the, you know, the great uh, cosmological writer, so it should be a lot of fun. You're going to be surrounded by all those uh, brilliant ladies of science yeah, writing. Yeah, 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 that's true. Lucky you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, man. Okay, well, John, um, well, I'll see you soon. Yeah, sounds good. Hang in Take there. Take it easy. Bye.